I'm a morning person. How many morning people do we have? I was a little concerned when the sheriff walked in this morning. I, thought, I was trying to think, do I have any outstanding tickets or anything? But uh, I'm glad he's part of the seminar today. So, officer, thanks for serving us today. Thank you so much. It is a privilege to, uh, to join you today. I love this environment. So I'm going to have more fun than you in, in this because there's nothing greater than learning and the joy of, uh, of people's journey. So thank you, uh, Dr. Craig, for allowing me to come. He, he introduces me and leaves. <laughs> Says something about my teaching, I guess. Um, you know, I've, I've learned something along the way that no one will listen to you unless they know your journey. So one of the things, especially when you don't know, how many of you weren't here two years ago? This is your first time to hear me speak. You've never heard me speak? Okay, most of you have never heard me speak. So you don't know anything about me. You just look at me and, and, and you say, well, he pastors this church. And please do not assess me based on the building or the church or the denomination or the way I look or my shirt. You may like blue or not. It doesn't matter. I don't care if you like me or not. God loves me today, right? Loves you too. But you don't know my journey. Um, I turned 61 the day after Christmas, so I'm 61. I'm in these last years of, uh, you know, at this point you begin to realize that you're more interested in leaving a legacy. You know, at your age, you're, you're talking and thinking of what impact am I going to have in terms of the local ministry that I have, but my life is now focusing on legacy. Because I realize I've, I'm almost 40 years that I've been a pastor. Uh, or a leader, and so I've, I've been this journey. I'm the, I'm the second child of Clarence and Irene Cope. Uh, my mom was saved under the ministry of Amy Simple McPherson. Um, she was a church planter. My father founded his own home church in the mountains of Tennessee. They met, fell in love, love at first sight, married. They've been married 66 years this month. Um, and... Um, They've been in ministry. My mom's 91, my dad's 84. I have a sister three and a half years older than I am. And uh, my sister's been in education. She was, a, she was a school teacher. And the interesting thing, I'll tell you a little bit more about this in my presentation, but uh, Judy, uh, being three and a half years older, Judy was, uh, she was the bright child. Uh, when she went to school, uh, well, I'll just say this. She was so intelligent that she graduated from high school when she was 15 went to a university when she was 16 by two months, was a full-time student in college. But I failed kindergarten. Literally could not, I could not count to 10 at the end of kindergarten the first year, so they ran me through again. And at the end of the second year, my dad heard God say, leave this town, go to this town, and so they moved and they put me in the first grade because any kid can't fail kindergarten twice. <laughs> At least not with a last name, Cope. So they put me in the first grade. And, uh, and, and it was not easy for me. So uh, my day of trauma started the day we were, been three months into the first grade. And you remember first grade over the board, they had the alphabet, remember? And so the teacher said, well, uh, I think everybody's been to the board. Because she'd give you a pointer, you'd go to the board, she'd call out a letter, you'd go find the letter. And everybody made 100. So some idiot in the room hollered out, George hasn't been to the board. And she said, George, is that true? And I had a, I had a choice to make at that point. If I lied and got caught, my dad would kill me. God would send me to hell, and I couldn't do that. No, I'm not just kidding. <laughs> so I said, no, I, I, I haven't been to the board. So she said, come on, George. So she gave me the pointer, and she, I went to the board, and she called out a letter. I don't remember the letter. went to the board, and pointed at the letter, and it wasn't the letter, and everybody laughed. She said, son, this isn't the game. I said, I understand that. Her name was Mrs. Clark. I'll never forget this lady. Not a game. She, she said, okay, let's try it again. So she gives me another letter. I went, I knew I had the letter this time, pointed at it, and everybody laughed louder. It wasn't the letter. She said, son, you're not going to disrupt this class. She said, I'm going to give you one more chance. So she called the letter, I went to the board, and I knew, I knew, I knew I had the letter this time. Pointed at it, and everybody laughed the loudest. She said, young man, come to me. And I walked over to her, she took the wooden pointer out of my hand, and she said, stretch out your hand. And I stretched them out, and she took that wooden pointer, 
and she wrapped me across the hands three times. And with tears running down my cheeks, I said to myself, if this is learning, I'll never learn again. And I failed the next six grades. And when I graduated from high school, I could barely read or write. My college entrance uh, application, my mother had to help me fill it out because I couldn't spell. But here is the bottom line. The key, God called me. If you've got the call of God on your life, you're set. You don't need to spell. And you don't have to spell. <laughs> Dr. Craig's sitting outside the door here, and so he's, uh, don't, I, don't tell him I can't spell, all right? No, no, probably um, No, that's why you hire good secretaries that can spell. But uh, God called me, and I'll remember the call, and, and the call was this, and we'll get to my study. The call was this, George Cope, I call you to be a pastor. I remember saying, it was so real, I heard this voice, never heard it before nor since, but I knew it was God, only God could do this. And I remember saying to that voice, who I've never heard again, I said, God, how can I be a pastor? I can't read or write. And in my spirit, I, I sense God say, I'll take care of that. And here I am, um, 40 years later, God was good. I went back to school 25 years I, I said I would never go to school again once I got out of Bible school I married at the end of my freshman year married the right woman for the wrong reason she was a straight A student and I was as dumb as a mud fence and she got me through college and I thought if I could just get out of college I'll be okay and then one day God spoke to me and said but I'm not done with you yet son so I went back and got my master's degree and then I went to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in Boston and got my doctorate degree in leadership and here I are, you know? And uh, look what the Lord has done. So if you have a child that has a learning challenge, by the way, one out of 10 students in college today have learning disabilities. Please let me be the poster child that says God doesn't make junk and God has a wonderful plan for your life even if you can't read or write very well. Uh, let's get to the subject. So now you know me, all right? So how many would have thought he's a dyslexic kid? Anybody? No, okay, see? So don't you judge the book by its cover because you got to know a little bit about me so that you can understand. Well, I, I don't, I don't want to preach at you this morning. I, I'm not even sure I want to teach you. I, you're my guinea pigs. I have written, I've, I've written eight chapters of a book. I have one chapter to go, and you're going to get it this morning, okay? I'm going to try it out on you in this process. Um, because I believe that uh, very clearly that God knows where we live and that God, um, he has this wonderful plan for our lives. I, everyone gets um, frustrated when we get lost traveling, don't we? You ever get frustrated when you get lost traveling? And, uh, and I am so grateful that on my iPhone that I have a GPS system. Uh, I, it, it, this is where we're at right here, and there's the church. It's on there, and I do this quite often now. I just simply plug in the address, and it gives me that, you know, the little, the little circle that sort of pulsates, and it, and it walks you to wherever you feel like you need to be going in the process. I, um, I got to thinking about the fact that leadership is about point A to point B. Andy Stanley talks about, uh, in, in his book, uh, one of his books, he talks about getting from here to there. And we tend to be here, and we know we need to be there, but the challenge is how do we get from here to there? And in, in the process, it would be great if somehow you could just write in your address and you knew where the destination was and you hit it like a GPS and you just see the little pulsation and you would know where you're at, you know how to go, but that's not the way God works. Here's what I want you to do on the front of your outline where it says, you know, this, we all are familiar with this. I want you to write your address, your home address, right down here or down at the bottom. Just write your home address in because I want to talk to you how to get from here to there. And you don't know where there is, and I don't know where there is, but I've come to talk to you about it this morning and try to help us to learn in the midst of it. Trying to figure out 
where you are causes, I've noticed in leadership, sheer pain and grief in the process. But this little lesson, these words on the front of your eye, look, look at the front first, because that, if you miss this, you miss the whole thing. Say it with me. God knows, read it with me. God knows where you live. Now that may seem trite and insignificant. But I remember when I was called into ministry and I was, uh, I was about ready to go to Bible school that my father and mother who had been in ministry, I remember saying to my dad, Dad, how do you know when and where God wants you? How do you know what to do? How do you know? And my dad was not an educated man. He went to school for one year. My mother got pregnant. They didn't have any money, so they left. My dad's a self-taught man. And my dad lived by little euphemisms. Dad had these little statements. And this statement is what my dad said to me. He said, son, God knows where you live. And when he's ready to move you, or when he wants you, he'll knock on your door. And I was naive enough to accept that. And I have lived my whole life on this premise. God knows where I live. Now, what I have noticed about when God knows where I live is that the lessons, now you can turn it over, that the lessons that I have learned I have learned in moments of transition that the lessons of life seem to have come in moments when um, I have reached a point and I don't really know what to do. It, it, it's an amazing thing that crucibles, challenges in leadership. How many would say right now, you're going through a challenge in your church or whatever you do, you're in a crucible, it's a hard place. You don't know what to do. You don't know what the next level is. Let me see. Yeah, let me see. Okay, great. Uh, let me just say to you, good. You're in a good place. We don't like those places because those places become very challenging. We want comfort and ease. We want to know exactly what the next step is. But the facts are that the lessons, if you go through your Bible, and I've done this, and I'll try to, I don't even know if I can get through. I've got more to say. We could stay here all day, so forgive me. I'm going to try to pack this in, and I don't know if I'll get through or not. If not, Craig will have to invite me back. Dr. Craig will have to invite me back, and I'll finish it next month. But, but I think that this whole process is that we have to just simply understand that in the journey, you are in these places because that's where you tend to learn the great lessons. I'm in... I'm reading Old and New Testament, and I journal every day. This morning, I read chapters 3 and 4 of Daniel, and I read chapters 3 and 4 of James. But in, it's interesting, Daniel is a non-commodity in kingdom existence until he goes to Babylon. Transition in his life. He moves, he's, he is a captive taken by Nebuchadnezzar, brought is viewed as an outstanding uh, opportunistic leader and he is put in a situation where he, uh, he has been chosen and he understands something from God but he doesn't know that his destiny is to be the prince under Nebuchadnezzar. It was a transition moment in his life. I challenge you, go through your Bible with this as your, your mark. What are the lessons learned in the transitions of life? And in those transitional moments, you will see character developed. You will see wisdom revealed. You will see God manifested. I would suggest to you that as I look back, what I thought was the most challenging moments of my life were opportunities for God to grow me as a leader like I've never seen before. Now, there are eight steps that uh, I, you have to look. Uh, if we're going to walk through this, we have to look at these transitions of life. And this is what I've discovered. Um, I want to do it all in the whole concept of a GPS system. Because the GPS 
is, is a significant thing. And I believe that uh, if a, a global positioning system, that's what GPS means, there's a satellite in the sky, your phone or your GPS on the dashboard of your car or whatever, it, it connects with a satellite that knows where you are and it tells you where you are. But I would suggest to you that it's not a global, it's a God's positioning system. And so GPS from now on is going to, for me, simply talk about the fact that you've got to understand what it is that, the, that we're going to deal with. And the first step, if you're going to be able to learn lessons, is that you have to understand the instruction manual. And the instruction manual is you've got to do and join me in understanding. It's very simply. I'm not going to try to teach you profound things. I just want to walk with you very simply that most people ignore instruction manuals. How many got, any, got a new appliance or something for Christmas? Did you get a new appliance? And uh, when you get a new phone, how many of you just sit down when you get a car or a phone or whatever? First thing you do is you just consume the instruction manual. You do? You are weird. You are nerdy people. <laughs> The rest of you didn't raise your hand, so I assume that you're like me. We've got it figured out, right? We can handle this. And yet the interesting thing about the instruction manual, the GPS, is that what I've discovered is the Word of God is really all we've got. God simply said in giving to us the Scriptures. It's more than a book to be read because we're spiritual people. I have discovered that I have learned how to move transitionally through life because I've taken God at his word in the midst of the process. There's some applications in the midst of this. Trust directions and you will arrive at your destination. If you don't believe that your GPS is accurate, you'll never get to the destination you plugged in on it. If you don't believe the word of God is accurate, you'll never get to the destination. Trusting God requires faith. I, again, there's so much wrapped up in this. But I have discovered that faith without works is dead, the Bible says. And in transitional moments, God has brought me to places where I will tell you in just a moment how that has worked. Jesus promised, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. And that is absolutely the promise that you and I have to understand. That in the transitions of life, that God knows where we live. He's called us. He knows where you're at. And he promised that he would be with you. Don't let the enemy uh, uh, create doubt in your heart. You, you are right today. You may feel like things are about to change. But today, you are in the right place at the right moment. God knows where you live. He knows your next moves. All he's asking you to do is be faithful to him and he will move you in the right direction. Your spiritual journey requires the use and trust of the manual. And if you don't, you will never learn and achieve in the, in the transitions of life that God wants to take you in because that's what life is all about in the process. It's all right there on your, on your, your GPS. Okay? Notice now we're taking a journey here. And uh, if you go, go to the right, first one, top line, the next one, uh, is, is that I've discovered is using the system. Now, it's one thing to say we've read the book, but it's another thing to use the system for the first time. Because that is learning to discern God's voice. That's the hard thing that most people don't know. How do you know it was God, George, um, when you heard God say, George Cope, I've called you to be a pastor? Because, uh, first of all, only God would ask me to do that. I would have never done that. Let me tell you, if I had my druthers this morning, I'd rather be sitting where you are than standing here. I am not the natural born leader. The question is, the age old question is, are leaders born or are they made? And I, I don't think it's either one. I think some leaders are born. I think other leaders are cultivated and made. I'm one of those kind of people that was not. My, my sister is a natural born leader. She's a type A personality. She's a, a, a choleric person. But I'm not. I'm a type C personality. I'm the laid back kind. I'm, the, I'm not the one that's always out front rah rah. But it's interesting that God still chose me. You may feel like, well, 
I don't work like my pastor. I, I, I'm not a Dave Ramsey kind of speaker. I'm not this or that. The, the bottom line is, is that if you've learned to, de to discern the voice of God and God has called you, then my friend, God has a purpose and a plan for you. And what you've got to understand is that, that you can do things that no one else can do. If I had time, I could talk to you about my role here in Calvary. I, I took a church that, that has a troubled past. I'm not proud of that, but I'm not ashamed of that. But I was the kind, I'm the kind of leader that God chose to use to bring healing and restoration to a broken congregation. I understand my calling. I've heard the voice of God. I know what I'm supposed to do. And I don't try to live outside of my realm of spiritual expertise. I'm a pastor. I have a pastor's heart. I'm not an evangelist. I'm a pastor. And so I, I function in that role. I make no apologies for that. I am what I am by the grace of God. Only God could take a dyslexic kid and make him a college president. Right? Mm -hmm. Only God could take us and do that. But we've got to learn to, to discern the voice of God in the midst of it. And um, the book will be easier to read than, than what I've had to, uh, than what I say this morning. Because I think that it's the, the truth is that we've got to learn to create familiarity with the Word of God so that we can attempt to know as God works in our particular life. Um, let me tell you the, the very first, uh, my first experience with using the system and learning to discern the voice of God. I was a youth pastor, and I, I was a youth pastor for about six months, and when I discovered that I hated teenagers. <laughs> I love them today. I love young adults, but as a youth pastor, I was not. When we, had, when we went on retreats, I went to bed because I'm an I'm a early person. They were kids or late people. They wouldn't obey me. I mean, it was just real. I was always the obedient child. So I did it for two and a half years, and, and, and God just about drove me crazy in the process. And I remember saying, God, I got to get out of this. This is not my calling. I remember uh, I got a phone call from a friend one day and said, hey, George, I'm going on vacation. Could you ask your pastor if you could come and preach for me? And I said, sure, Mike, I'd be glad to do that. So I talked to my pastor. He said, sure, George, go down and do it. So on a Sunday, I went down, and uh, he was gone, and I preached that morning. It was in the inner city of Chicago. And uh, I stayed over, went to some people's house that afternoon, and that night spoke again. That was in the day when we had morning and night services. And... Uh, and, and I, as I got in my car at the end of that service, I felt like I was going to die. I, this overwhelming fear came over me. And I remember laying my head on the steering wheel. And I said, God, I'm prepared to die. But I'm a, I'm a young husband and a young father. And I don't want to die. So I started my car. And I thought, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. But God, I don't want to die. And the closer I got to home, I had to drive 40 miles. The less I felt the fear. And, and when I pulled in the driveway, my wife was not there. She had taken our daughter and gone to visit her parents. And uh, the moment I took my key and I stuck my key in the door, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, inside, no audible voice, just simply said, you're going to pastor that church. Just like that. I thought, wow, it's interesting. Never had that thought before. Didn't go there thinking that. But they had a pastor. You're going to pastor that church. So I, I open the door, go in, lay down, go to sleep. Two weeks later, I'm sitting on the couch one afternoon with my wife and my daughter. The phone rings two weeks later. And it's the pastor that said, George, while I was gone, God told me that he was done with me here. And I'm sitting in a board meeting. And he said, we, the board would like to ask you if you would consider being the pastor of this church. Mm -hmm. I had not told my wife. I had not said anything to anybody. God spoke to me. Learning to discern the voice of God was, I didn't know when, I didn't know how, I didn't try to knock a door down, I didn't go and resign. I just knew that God was speaking to me. Now, the applications. 1 Samuel 3.16, God calls Samuel, but he doesn't recognize his voice. And yet, when he comes to Eli, Eli, after the third time, says... Next time you hear that voice, just say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Some of us have got to learn that. Learning to distinguish between faith and fear becomes the real challenge 
in the midst of our, our, our learning and the transitions of life. Because we can fear and say, this isn't working. God isn't in a hurry, so don't rush your decisions. Um, in that process, that's the one thing, if I would just, in this, in this context, learning to discern the voice of God, we are always in a hurry. Just be patient. God's doing something. He, Jesus learned obedience through his suffering, Hebrews said. He, 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 suffering isn't easy. But if you're going to learn, sometimes transitions put us in tight spots where we have to learn. Don't rush your decision because God knows what he's doing. Using the system that God wants to teach you, this God positioning system, you're in the right place at the right moment until God moves you. He's got plans and purposes for your life. If you believe that, say yes. yes. That's good. That's good. If it's God, it'll come to pass. If it's God. You see, that's the difference between pizza before you go to bed and God. <laughs> if it's pizza and you just get this thought, it doesn't come to pass. Isn't it interesting? This, is, this may or may not surprise you. I have never written a resume in my life. I have never asked to go anywhere. I have always been invited. I didn't ask to come to Calvary. I didn't even know Calvary needed a pastor. I preached there six months before they invited me to come as a college president. And somebody said in that service, if we ever needed a pastor, he'd be a great guy. But I didn't go there because they thought I was a great guy. I came there because of the gifts that God has given to me to bring healing and restoration to a congregation that was deeply broken and hurt. That's why I went there. Not because I'm a good speaker. Not because I have a doctorate degree. Not because of who I am, but because God had a plan. And uh, if I had time, I could get you that. Let me give you the third one here. A GPS is only as good as the address you give it. When God's direction is delayed. Um, there, there's a whole part of this. Um, I, every one of these lessons have an attachment. So in my book, I'm going to tell you my story. I have a story. And again, I, I know we're getting hungry. So, uh, but let me just tell you this one. And I'm going to jump ahead uh, at some things here. The, the, after I pastored, left that youth pastor, went to the inner city of Chicago, I pastored that church for 10 years. And at the end of 10 years... I realized that uh, one day I was praying and I felt like the Holy Spirit said, prepare to leave. And um, the one thing you have to understand is that when God does those kinds of things, you then begin to start saying, okay, God, what's next? And let me assure you that every phone call of opportunity that comes is not always God. So what you have to learn to do is it's only as good as the address that you give it. Um, I, God told me to prepare to leave, and about three months later, my phone rang, and it was this church that was across the state in Illinois, and so I went over there. I just, well, God had told me maybe this is the next step, so I go to this church, and I meet with the, pa the, the board, and I mean, it was just one of those kind of instant clicks, and uh, in fact, it was such a marvelous meeting that at the end of the meeting, they stood and they said, you're our next pastor. We're going to invite you, and I said, wait a minute. Would you give me three days to pray about this? And they said, sure. Because I don't feel like you do any, you have to pray. You have to know this is what God. So we joined hands and they thanked God for their new pastor. And we let go hands. And the next day my wife and I got up and drove back. And I had three days to pray about it. And, and in the midst of it, they, they promised me they would call me in three days. And in, uh, in three days came and they never called. And four days came and they didn't call. And five days came and went and they didn't call. On the sixth day, I called them. <laughs> and, and I said, you said, you, did we get this mixed up? No, we didn't get it mixed up. Um, we're sorry to have to tell you, but we're not going to invite you to come. And I, I thought to myself, but God, I felt free to this. And in, in the midst of it, I realized that in God's timing, everything is beautiful. They, they said, well, this is what happened. A very famous person in the Assemblies of God called them and said, we would like to recommend this person to you. 
And so they jumped over me to get to him because they thought that this person that had a very strong reputation knew better about the situation. And you know what? It was God in the midst of it. A year goes by. God told me to prepare it a year before I left. But the address that I put in and thought was the address was not the address. What I discovered is that God does everything. The church that I go to a year later is a church that's bankrupt. And your faith is going to be tested wherever God takes you. And you can't see failure as being final. I, uh, I took a church that was bankrupt. They had built a building with 18% interest back in the seven, in late 70s, early 80s. And when I got there, they had $2,000 in the bank. They couldn't afford to pay me, but they brought me anyway. And God told me to go there. And the long and short was, is that four years later, on, a, on Super Bowl Sunday, which was the last Sunday of January in those days, 1987, I took 117 people to lunch, and 117 people gave $400,000 cash in 1987. And that church turned around. And God sent me to a bankrupt church to teach me faith and test my faith to a degree that I'd never been tested before. Because we got to remember it's about the journey and not always the destination. That's a vital principle for you. What I've written down, these are vital principles for you. Most of us think the destination. Yeah, we all know that. What's the destination? Heaven. That's the ultimate destination. But, but heaven isn't on earth. It's the journey. Where you're at in the journey is the critical piece to where your life is functional right now for God. Does that make sense? So you can't look at the situation and say that uh, I'm out of sync in the midst of all that. Lost and frustrated? Anybody ever been lost and frustrated? When God asked me to leave that church, that was the most frightening, lost situation I'd ever been in in my life. When the directions don't make sense. This church was bankrupt and we were trying to get a, uh, we were trying to get a mortgage. And we couldn't get a mortgage. And God spoke to me and said, I want you to leave. It was the hardest thing that I've ever done. Because as a shepherd, you feel responsible for your sheep. But in the process, I thought God had made this drastic mistake. And uh, in the process, I felt like Mary. When Gabriel told her her destiny, she questioned, how can this be? There are going to be moments in your life, in your leadership, when God is going to ask you to do things that you're going to feel like Mary when God says, I want you to do this, I want you to make this decision, I want you to go here, I want you to change this, I want you to move this church in a different direction, and you're going to say, how can this be? God doesn't have to make sense. God is always right. So it's a lesson you learn in transitions, is that it's not always sensible. I left a church that did not have that final, they needed a mortgage. They were going to be foreclosed on. But here was the deal. I was in a leadership position in Illinois, and they, the leadership of the Assemblies of God wouldn't co-sign because I was the head of the finance uh, department for the Assemblies of God in Illinois. And they thought that would be nepotism to give me a break that they wouldn't give other pastors. And so I left, but here's the, here's the quick story. They hired another pastor within 30 days, and that man knew the treasurer of the Assemblies of God, and he had the mortgage before he got there. I had to get out of the way for God to do what God needed to do in the next step. Sometimes we think everything rides on us. Never forget, God doesn't need me. He uses me. He uses you. And so often we think this ministry hinges. Let me tell you, Calvary doesn't need me. God will continue to prosper that church and lead that church whether George Cope is there or not. God uses me because in this time I've learned that when things don't always make sense, he does. He's right. He knows what he's doing in the process. And relinquishing our plans to God doesn't mean defeat but reflects total trust. God will confirm his plans. I... Uh, 
That's what I meant when God gave the mortgage and, the, and, and that building now is paid off. They built another building. That building's paid off and that church is flourishing. I did my job. Lessons learned in the transitions of life. <coughs> the purpose of a GPS. It's a divine perspective of your future. God, God's positioning. These lessons that you're learning is that you've got to understand that there's a divine perspective that you can't see. I didn't see a doctor degree coming in my life. I never thought I was, I mean, I knew that I had abilities, and I knew that I wasn't dumb, but I don't think and process like other people. So, I, you know, it's just not that, that way of me. But I, I understood that God is our guide. Genesis 12:1. Well, you know what that says? It, that's when God comes to Abraham, and I'm not sure that Abraham was the first person God ever spoke to, to try to find the father of the Jewish nation. I'm not sure of that. We don't know if God spoke to others. It may be that God spoke to other men that weren't willing to, to go out. But he says to Abraham, leave. The first thing he says is leave. And he had to trust him in the midst of it. God is our guide. God will prepare your transitions with lessons from his word. That's why you go back to the manual. Because everything you see in God's word will find application in your life. There was a day God asked me to leave another church and go to Zion Bible College. And I, I had no idea that I would ever be in an institutional environment. It didn't make sense. God had a divine perspective for my life. What I understood is that there were many people like me that nobody believed in. And ministry oftentimes is a very lonely place. And, and preparing leaders and encouraging leaders is a hard thing to do, especially in the church. There's more support in the world than there often is in the church. And let me just go and say there's a lot of jealousy in the church that shouldn't be in the church. In fact, my father's generation wouldn't make room for my generation. I have a part of a generation that got passed over because my father's generation, they continued to lead because it was all about what they had built and what they had done. And if you are working around people that are older, oftentimes that they're very possessive of that because there's a sense of fear to relinquish to the next generation. Now I'm stepping on toes, aren't I? Forgive me for talking so long. I wish I could give you, but I don't, Craig only gave me. I got to stop here in a few minutes. Hey, you know, I'm, is this okay? Have, are you learning anything? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I'm having fun. Okay, it doesn't matter about you. I'm having fun, all right? Um, but I think that in the midst of it, what I've learned is that, you know, Elijah, there was a moment when God was through with Elijah and Elisha was there. And I think that in the midst of it, that God will prepare your transitions with lessons from his words. There's some of you that are in those moments that the Elijah, and the, you're the Elisha, and you're going to emerge on the, scenes, uh, on the scene. There are going to be others of you that have a Paul and a Timothy Titus relationship, and you're going to go out, and you're going to pastor and do other things. But in the process, God will do that. And when God says leave, he will make it easy for you to do it. That, that transition when I left was the hardest transition of my life because the district overseer said when I left that church, if you leave, you're never welcome to come back in this district again. He thought I was abandoning the church. What he didn't realize is that God knew exactly what he was doing. So sometimes people, will, their voices will say, you're not doing the right thing. That's why you've got to know God's voice in the process. When the GPS shows clear, but the road's closed. You ever had a detour? You know, I, I've got, in my GPS, I haven't updated it. And, and 414, which is Maitland Boulevard, if you go out to the new road out at 4, if you get out there, it just goes into oblivion in the GPS system. Because that road isn't on my old one for my wife. I haven't updated her GPS. It just looks like you're driving in an open field. You know, the road is there. But sometimes they do that in the process. You see, GPS is no, every, uh, God's positioning knows every detour and will safely take you to where your destiny is designed. So what you appear at times to be at a place where the road, you're at a fork in the road. God knows where the fork in the road is. 
And you have to understand that he knows how to get you there. I heard in leaving on one occasion that God spoke to me and said, I brought you to a fork in the road. And the road, George, that you're choosing to travel is not the road I've chosen for you to travel. Don't look to the right or to the left, but keep your eyes on me. That was a clear word in my spirit from God one morning. I knew that was from God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Um, sorry about that. I love that. That's one of my favorite portions of scripture. Be prepared. You will encounter divine detours on your journey. And they're all intentional with God. Downloading updates. Understanding transitions. I think that when we get to the end, what we have to understand in life is that you came here today, you really didn't know, and, and this may be a lesson you think, what? why did I waste my time? Let me tell you something, that we are daily activating God in our life when we're just learning. The books you're reading, the, the, the experiences that you're in, the, the, the life situation, sickness, family issues, you and I can't assume that your life and your family is removed from your ministry. It's the same. Because God is at work in all things in our life. And I think that what we have to do is spiritually understand that every day God wants to download new things in our life for us. You're the safest when guided by God's positional system. Uh, I can look back over 39 years and say, and I'm not saying this braggadociously, I have never lived outside of the will of God. I've never had to, I've never made a decision that I've had to find my way back into something. I'm not saying I'm perfect by any means, but I'm just simply saying that what I'm sharing with you, that in taking time, in working, in processing, in waiting for confirmations, in listening to my father's simple instruction, George, God knows where you live. And when he needs you, he'll knock on your door. That you're the safest when you're there. You saw me before I was born. I, this is my life verse. Watch it. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every day was laid out before a single day had passed. That's Psalm 139, 15 and 16. My, God knew I was going to be a dyslexic kid. God knew I was going to have troubles. God knew all of those things. But you know what? God let me go through them. Let me suggest to you that if I had it to do over again, and I could pick or choose my life, I could have my sister's life or I could have my life, I would still be dyslexic again. And I'll tell you why. Because God used my learning challenges to create a personality and a style and an ability that would have never come any other way. My sister loves the Lord. She's a great Bible teacher, but my sister doesn't like people. She'd come in here and she'd talk to you and she'd pack her bag and walk out. And if she spoke to you, it would be, I mean, she'd be kind. She's not rude. But people don't, you know, just let me go learn something else. Me, I want to put my arm around you. I want to know your journey. I want to hear your heart. My sister said to me one day, George, I, I would have killed, I, I could have never pastored the church. I'd have killed everybody in the church because they wouldn't have listened to me. <laughs> and you know what? What I do is I look at people in the church and I realize, you know what? They got problems just like I do. And they need to simply understand that if God can use a guy like me, he can use a person like them. God used, you remember that old song, Ordinary People, God Uses Ordinary People? And so in the process, you've got to understand that God knew you and he ordained you and he's got a plan for you. And with us, I'm going to be done. God's positioning system has always been available. Have you discovered it in your life? I hope that um, I've made some sense for you today. 
Again, as I said, you were my guinea pigs. If not, you can critique me, and if it's not been good, please tell Dr. Craig, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, lick my wounds. It's okay. It's not going to hurt me. <laughs> but I, I guess as I look back, I will close with this, that um, no one ever told me things like this. No one ever stood up and said, they never talked out of their heart and their experiences. They, they, they always tried to spiritualize everything. And, to, and I began to think that somehow my life was weird because I was learning and perceiving spiritual things very differently than people were trying to communicate them, even in the classroom to me. Until I realized that ministry and life are, are parallel tracks. And your best ministry comes when you share your life. As Dr. Craig said, uh, last year I took a two-month sabbatical. I reached the end of my road. In fact, I walked into my church leaders one night with my wife, and I said, I quit. I resign. I can't do this anymore. My elders looked at me and said, Pastor, you can't quit. And I said, yes, I can. <laughs> and they said, well, what, would we, what can we do? And I said, Listen, I, I, I can't do this anymore. Either you give me some time or I'm out of here. And they said, fine, take some time. And I left for two months. I took a two-month sabbatical. They gave me a two-month sabbatical. Long and short was when I came back, I realized that even in what I thought I knew, God had so much more. In fact, I wrote everything that's on your page, I wrote in two hours one day sitting on the sabbatical when God said, let me put your life in perspective, George. Two hours. Just started writing. And the outline was there. When I came back, I didn't preach one message, I preached four. I talked about my own personal life and my transition. How I lost my perspective of journey. And here was the bottom line. When you try to be something that you're not, and you try to lead in ways that you can't. You will burn the candle at both ends and you will, be a, you will be ineffective for both your ministry and your own personal life and family. But when you walk the parallel tracks of life with a God positioning system and everything that you're going through and where you're at, what you've been through is all part of God's plan. He makes sense of it and he takes you to where he wants you to be. You're in a good place. God has a wonderful plan. And his perspectives are great for you. Stay on the journey. Update. Learn. Get to know. And with this, God will take you places you've never dreamed you can go. Because God wants to give you his best. Not just good, but the best. There you got it. All right? No, no, no. Just want to, um, I'll answer questions since I'm a little over and you're going to have breakfast. I'll be in there and if you've got any questions, please talk to me. Give me a critique. Help me. Hopefully that's been helpful and they understand. But I want to pray for you right now. Can I do that? How many, are, how many would say, after this, George, I am in a transitional moment and I really need God I need, I need something right now. I came to this room. I need something. Just hold up your hand. Put your, okay. Good. All right. Just, you're by somebody. So just reach over. Put your hand on them. Just put your hand on them right now. Okay. Guys with guys, just put your hand on them. In the name of Jesus, I speak revelation and understanding and perspective over this group today. Holy Spirit, you who was sent to this earth on the command of Jesus that would be our comforter and our guide, would you bring God's perspective, revelation and understanding to questioning hearts? May they not feel guilty or condemned because they're questioning, but may they use their questions as doorways to the revelation of God's perspective 
for their life. Transition is a scary place, but it is a good place because that's where we learn the great lessons of life. May your Holy Spirit comfort and strengthen and encourage every heart in crisis moments today. And I'll thank you and praise you for it. For you are a good God. And you love your leaders. I bless them to be salt and light in a dark and tasteless world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thanks, Dr. Craig. Appreciate it.